As you know, when I introduce a unit, I like to give our friend Frederick Copleston a few words. He's uh, got a few things to say about the man himself, Socrates. You've seen a couple dramatic portrayals of him so far. This one I prefer. In the first week, in the first class, I showed a, a more modern documentary that he was a character in as well, but no one played him. He was just a clay figure there that they had a camera on. But anyway, that was well done also. But now that you have a bit of an image in your mind of, uh, of, of what Socrates might have been like, let's hear a few things about him. The first significant thing, or at least the first thing I have highlighted in my notes here that Copleston points out about Socrates is, of all things, the profession of Socrates' mother. Which might seem strange to hear that this is the first significant thing pointed out, um, but it's actually very fitting. The profession of Socrates' mother is a profession that Socrates metaphorically applies to himself and his own task, his own mission. His mother was a midwife, and Socrates claims that he himself is a midwife of sorts. How on earth is Socrates a midwife? Well, first of all, what is a midwife is someone who helps at births. And Socrates was not a literal midwife, that's for sure. But he did help his task, his mission, his whole approach to philosophy and dialogue was allegorically that of a midwife. Why? I've been at three births now, each of which have been natural and without any pain meds, although I certainly could have used some. Uh, just joking, my wife. It's my wife who didn't have the pain meds, although well, I didn't either. Anyway, I, the point is, in birth, who's doing the work? The midwife or the mother? The mother. The mother's doing just about all the work. The midwife is important, but she's there for support, guidance, a little bit of help if things go wrong, someone who's experienced with this, and, and so on and so forth. It's real good to have a midwife there, or a doctor. Uh, so that you don't have to go at it on your own. Well, how is that like Socrates? Allegorically. He does the same thing in dialogues, doesn't he? The whole point of the Socratic method is that he's not just standing there telling you facts to accept because he said it. He wants you to be the one to allegorically give birth to the conclusions on your own. And he's just there to kind of help the process along, guide it, ask some questions and, uh, and enable you to be the one in giving the answers to come to the conclusions on your own. So it's very fitting that he would call himself a midwife because it so well uh, runs parallel to the same approach he takes to these dialogues. Uh, but there's a, a twofold reason why it's so accurate for, for Socrates to call himself a midwife. Um, the other one gets to his theory of knowledge, which we don't go into in depth in this class because it's not as helpful of some of his other teachings, and it's a whole can of worms, but Socrates and Plato famously have a rather interesting, even if probably incorrect, view on the nature of knowledge, that, it, that all learning is just what? Remembering. All knowledge is just recollection from before you were born, when, and then you forgot everything. So. How is that relevant to the midwife analogy? Well, the, obviously the child isn't coming to existence when it is born. It's already been there for nine months. Just like Socrates in dialoguing is not proposing to teach you anything you didn't already know, but to just bring out something you already knew that was already there, latent within you. Um, so Aristotle disagrees completely. He says, no, you learning really is learning. You're not remembering things. You, you, and I think Aristotle is right, but still, it's, in it's interesting to note. Anyway, the next thing here, let's take a look at Copleson's remarks following. He makes some remarks on Socrates. A lot of biographical information about Socrates can be found in one of the dialogues called Symposium. 
We also know that Socrates was possessed of a particular robustness of body and powers of endurance. As a man, he wore the same garment winter and summer, and continued his habit of going barefoot, even on a winter campaign. Although very abstemious, meaning with holding back, in food and drink, he could drink a great deal without being any the worse for it. I have to read that. Everybody takes note of that with Socrates. He was very much against excess, obviously, but he did enjoy a couple drinks. Uh, but apparently, no, no matter how much he drank, he never got drunk, which is a good thing. From his youth upwards, he was the recipient of prohibitory messages or warnings from his mysterious voice or sign or daimon. You heard a lot about that in the trial, this voice that Socrates hears. The symposium tells us of his prolonged fits of abstraction, one lasting a whole day and a night, and that on a military campaign. He was a soldier at one point. There were prolonged fits of abstraction due to intense mental concentration on some problem, a phenomenon not unknown in the case of some other thinkers, even if not on so large a scale. What is going on here? We have to pause at that as well, because this is significant. Socrates had these fits of abstraction, and that's one way of putting it, but really they were ecstasies. And you hear about this, I don't mean anything chemical, he wasn't a drug user, I mean philosophical ecstasies. And I don't know too many philosophers who have philosophical ecstasies, but Socrates did. You, you hear of ecstasies written about much in, in various mystical religious traditions. And quite literally, an ecstasy is when the person having it, and I don't speak from experience, I've never experienced anything like this, is completely suspended from the senses because of some sort of mental phenomena going on. So much so that you could punch them in the face and they wouldn't know it. They would have no idea. Complete sensory suspension. Uh, so this happened to Socrates because he thought so hard. <laughs> uh, it, didn't, it didn't happen all the time, but every now and then he would think so hard about something, he'd have a fit of abstraction. And this one apparently lasted a whole day and a night while he was out on a military campaign. His superiors couldn't have been too happy with that, but there's nothing they could do about it. And, and I like to pause on this because I think it explains why sometimes when you're reading a dialogue, it seems that he's already thought of everything beforehand. It's because he has, not everything, but a lot. I, I, I will never know, of course, what exactly was going on in these fits of abstraction, but I, I, I suppose that he was going through every possible way a dialogue could, could go in his head, not just for the sake of preparing a speech, of course not, just for the sake of trying to arrive at the truth. He would take some question and ponder it so deeply, examine every possible answer to it, examine every possible situation and contingency, that this would take some time and it would be so intense that he would be suspended from the senses. Um, and to really consider every possibility does, does indeed take a long time. Anyone play chess against computers? I, if this, even bringing this example up, I suppose they say dates me, but um, I, I loved chess when I was very little. I still love it, just don't really play it anymore. But I had a computer, probably the 80s, that uh, could play chess, and you could set its difficulty level up. And when it was uneasy, it made a move like that, real quick. But when you put it up to hard, it took a long time to figure out what to do next. Why? Was that? It was, yeah, it was, it was quote thinking. It was to figure out, for a computer to figure out what move, like computers don't have any real intelligence, so all they can do is add up all the probabilities of every possible thing that could happen after a given uh, event. So it sees your move and it, it, it has to calculate all these different chess games that are possible to transpire given the moves that have happened already and assign a probability to each of them and add them all up and see what. It basically, yeah, that's a lot of calculations, and I'm not saying Socrates was merely calculating things, but I think he was going through all sorts of different ways dialogues could go in his head, and largely coming to conclusions on his own, although he still very much wanted to dialogue with other people, of course. So these fits of abstraction happen to him often, hopefully not too often, but continuing on here, it says that thought, when Socrates was in his early 20s, thought 
turned away from the cosmological speculations of the Ionians toward man himself. In other words, the age of the pre-Socratics was ending and the age of the Sophists was beginning. That was happening when Socrates was in his early 20s. So it was a perfect time for his life because that all of the huge debates, finally, finally the Sophists were taking this new method of investigation that the pre-Socratics had come up with and applying it to man himself, the questions that actually pertain to our life and, and, and need to be answered. They weren't answering them well, obviously, but they were bringing the questions up. And this happened when Socrates was in his early 20s, and that's some point around there he had his major change, his moment. Um, the so-called conversion of Socrates, as Copleston refers to it here. I'll read this short paragraph. The conversion of Socrates, which brought about the definite change to Socrates, the, as the ironic moral philosopher, seems to have been due to the famous incident of the Delphic Oracle. Chirophon, a devoted friend of Socrates, asked the Oracle if there was any man living who was wiser than Socrates, and received the answer, no. One simple word that changed everything. Um, anyway, we'll talk more about that event when we go through it in the Apology in our discussion. But I just wanted to note something that Copleston says here. Uh, However strange the story of the oracle may appear, it most probably really happened, since it is unlikely that Plato would have put a mere invention into the mouth of Socrates in a dialogue which obviously purports to give a historical account of the trial. All right, so Copleston is not saying that you have to believe that there's this literal god Apollo who literally spoke to this oracle and, and, and Obviously, how you take those things is up to you. What he's saying here is for historical reasons, we have no grounds to doubt that this event really was recounted that, at, at this trial. Um, I'm going to get into the problem, the so-called problem of Socrates in a moment where we're, we're trying to piece together what exactly he did and said is not always easy. But suffice it to say that the apology is quite trustworthy because, as Copleston says, this is the record of a trial published during the lifetimes of people who were at that trial. Plato never would have been able to get away with just inventing a bunch of stuff and putting it in there. You can't, uh, you can't do that. If you are a fiction writer, you can't get that passed off as the transcript of a court trial, not even in ancient Athens. Um, so this event, whatever you want to believe on what was going on behind the scenes of it, the event itself happened. There was this oracle at Delphi. Socrates' friend went to ask the oracle if anyone was wiser, and this oracle, whoever she was, said no. Um, and this is what changed Socrates' whole life. Because before then, he was dabbling in the waters of philosophy, perhaps. Clearly, he was already quite wise. Otherwise, it would have made no, no sense for his friend to go ask some oracle if he was the wisest in the world. But that moment sealed the deal and set him in the direction of philosophizing for the rest of his life, which uh, he never turned back from. All right. The problem of Socrates. This is the dilemma of what exactly Socrates taught and what was really just taught by whom? who wrote everything down that Socrates, I mean, who was the only one really significantly who wrote Socrates' words? Plato. Plato, Socrates' student, I mean, Socrates had plenty of students, but Plato was one of the ones who followed him around. Socrates didn't have to start a school or anything, it's just people follow him. Plato was one of those followers. Um, Socrates never wrote anything, as we said. So, being that we have Basically, I mean, he's mentioned in plenty of other places. We know he existed and was a philosopher. But being that almost all of his philosophical corpus is simply from the Platonic corpus, there is, of course, much debate on what exactly Socrates really said and what exactly was simply taught by Plato using Socrates as a mouthpiece after Socrates died. Um, some people say all the dialogues are pure fiction. That's obviously not true. Some people are in the opposite extreme. But at the end of the day, the problem of Socrates, what exactly was said by Socrates and what 
really was just said by Plato. It doesn't matter. Who cares? Like, man, some philosophers waste their whole careers agonizing over what exactly was said by Socrates and what was by Plato. It doesn't matter. We're, we're doing philosophy here, not history. We don't have to get all those historical details right. This is just a good, this is a good excuse to talk about the philosophical themes that are still important for us today. At the end of the day, it mean, makes no difference to me whether Socrates said something or whether Plato did. Um, so I'll just take what the dialogues say as Socrates' words. That's fine by me. I don't care. Uh, I'm not trying to be flippant here. I'm trying to be pragmatic without succumbing to the philosophy of pragmatism. That's another whole other debate. But we should all be pragmatic and practical uh, as long as it's not the expense of other concerns. It's very relevant in, for example, theological and religious and, and even some scientific debates who exactly said what. Why is it so important in those contexts? In a religious tradition, you're taking a teaching on what? Or at least in part, you may well be taking a teaching on faith and authority, exactly. So, you know, Muslims, for example, debate a lot about what exactly Muhammad said and what he didn't. And it's under, completely understandable that a Muslim would have that debate because if he did say something, it's binding on all Muslims, and if he didn't, it's not. So that's a very important debate for a Muslim to have. Uh, but the whole point of philosophy is that we're not taking any philosophical conclusions on faith. Not that there's anything wrong with taking things on faith. It's just not the job of philosophy is all. Our job now is to analyze everything in accordance with reason and see where that leads us. So it really doesn't even matter because we don't have this authority question to settle. Philosophy doesn't have that type of authority to be concerned with. So I just say that to, uh, to I don't know, prepare you for the various things you'll hear in the future, uh, laughing off all of these things that Socrates taught by someone who says, oh, it was all just Plato's invention. Even if it was, who cares? First of all, it wasn't. There's no solid historical grounds for saying this is all Plato's invention. Much of it was certainly Socrates himself. And by the way, even Aristotle, I can't remember exactly when he was born, but he was very close to Socrates, of course. So Aristotle being the, the student of Plato, Plato being the student of Socrates. Aristotle himself says there's, there's uh, he, he talks directly about Socrates' teachings as distinct from Plato's. All right, so Socrates really taught things, really existed, really did all this stuff. And the Apology really is an account of the trial. So if you do have a great historical interest in this, I, I find I don't have too many students who do, and that's fine. But if you do, just bear in mind that as we're going through this trial, you're not reading a work of fiction. Even if some people try to argue that all these other Platonic dialogues are fiction, even though they're wrong, they're not all fiction. Um, this really happened. You're really reading the trial of a man who was condemned to death because of his principles, and this is how he handled it. And that's very inspiring when you know this is nonfiction, not just something that somebody dreamt up. All right, that being said, let's dive in. And we'll see how much we can cover before we take a break. And if I get too into this, don't let me hold you guys past 7.30 before giving you a break. All right, the very first line. It is often said that the first line of a Platonic dialogue gives away a lot about its nature, about its fundamental point, its main thrusts, thesis perhaps. Well, whether or not that's the case, the first line of this one is certainly significant. Socrates says, how you have felt, O men of Athens, at hearing the speeches of my accusers, I cannot tell. But I do know that their persuasive words almost made me forget who I was. First of all, this tells us that we're not picking up at the very beginning of this trial. This, this account here, stuff was going on. We hear, of course, from Miletus within these pages, but we didn't hear the main speeches condemning, we don't have records of the main speeches condemning Socrates. So we can only wonder what exactly was said in those. But Socrates' response is that, I almost forgot who I was. So persuasive were their words. Yet they have hardly spoken a word of truth. And there ends the first sentence. 
I just let me just repeat the second, uh, the last part there. I know that their persuasive words almost made me forget who I was. Such was the effect of them, and yet they have hardly spoken a word of truth. How can you forget who you are? Well, I'm sure Socrates is exaggerating a bit. I don't think he did almost forget who he was, but maybe he came close to almost forgetting who he was. And it seems so strange. How on earth could one forget who he is? Well, here's the problem. You can. And what can do that to you? Seductive sophistry. There's a book, Philosophy 101 by Socrates, and I just want to take a look at a couple quotes from here. This is written by a philosopher who's actually alive today, Dr. Peter Kreeft. And he sees, buried within the apology itself, a complete overview of all philosophy. And may, I think he's taking it a bit far, maybe, but still, he found some real gems. And the first thing I want to take note of from this book is precisely this first line. I almost forgot who I was. Philosophy is not morally selfish, but mentally selfish. And I'm quoting from Dr. Kreef now. Know thyself is almost philosophy's definition. You can be knowledgeable without knowing yourself, but you cannot be wise without knowing yourself. For if you do not know yourself, if you are a stranger to yourself, if you have never wondered about the knower, but only the known, then no matter how much knowledge you have, you do not know the one who has it. Know thyself was inscribed over the Delphic Oracle's temple. It was the first commandment of the god Apollo, who supposedly inspired the oracle. Um, know thyself. So this is this primary commandment of this god Apollo, and it's inscribed over the very temple where Socrates, from which Socrates received his divine mandate. And he begins this apology, this defense, by saying, I almost forgot who I was. What's going on here? Well, he is highlighting and underlining and putting an exclamation point next to the seductive power of sophistry and how it does not lead to the truth. Um, the, uh, the next thing here, as we shall soon see, Socrates took this commandment more seriously than any other Athenian did. It was supremely ironic that he was the only Athenian ever executed for a religious crime. Uh, yeah, there wasn't some inquisition going on in Athens. It's not like he was just caught up in the inquisition. This was a, they really had to try hard to trump up a charge against him here. Socrates' predecessors, the pre-Socratics, had wondered about many things, the elements, the heavenly bodies, the mysteries of nature, the gods, numbers. But Socrates philosophized only about human life and its moral problems, virtues and vices, wisdom and follies, rights and wrongs. Perhaps that was the reason he knew lesson one so well. Nothing is harder to know than the self. No questions resist certainty and closure more than moral questions, because nothing is deeper and closer to us. Try to measure the earth and you may succeed, as one ancient Greek actually did. And you may think you are wise, but try to measure yourself and your life's meaning and things like truth, goodness, beauty. You will find that you are swimming in waters far over your head. The world inside your head is much bigger than the world outside your head. All right, let me just punctuate that a bit. Um, this power of sophistry to be able to cause one to forget who he is, in other words, can make one forget the deepest and most important things. And yet, those, this is possible because those deepest and most important questions the very nature of the questions, they fight against certainty in a way that the empirical questions don't. And it doesn't mean we can't be certain about them. It just means it requires more effort to be so. It requires more conviction to remain steady in the path of those truths. Um, empirical truths, you can hold on to them very easily. I am convinced that no one will be able to cause anybody here to ever doubt that two plus two is four because it's rather close at hand, dry, factu uh, factual indeed. Um, but more than that, you know, if someone came in here and, and was arguing for um, flat, uh, flat Earth theory, even if he had a PhD after his name and was giving all sorts of seemingly good arguments, you probably wouldn't believe him. Why? Maybe you would, I don't know, but... It's, yeah, it's so... 
utterly empirically obvious that the earth is not flat, that there's not much of a temptation to forget that fact. Very few, you know, it's not even something that's taken on faith of the scientific theory. So you can, you can go ahead and verify the curvature of the Earth for yourself in a number of ways. First of all, you could take a telescope and look at other planets, see that they're round, and you'd wonder why wouldn't ours be also. You can, um, you can look over the sea. You can, you can glance out at the sea and realize that you see what first when things are coming in? When ships are coming in, sorry. Yeah, you can see the top of the ship first, which would make no sense if the Earth were flat. Um, Number of other number of other things. Anyway, so that's well and good. It doesn't change your life at all knowing the Earth is round versus it being versus the theory that it's flat. But much more tragically, I'm not saying this about anybody specifically, but people in general will be more likely to forget who they are, even though those are much more important than whether the Earth is round or flat. Questions about who we are. If someone if someone walks in here with a different type of a PhD, maybe I don't know. Psychology, psychiatry, uh, nothing, nothing against those studies. They're very good and useful and helpful. But someone could walk in here and say, you know what? It's, they could give a long talk on how it's really good for your mental health and your self-esteem and your self-image to, um, you know, just kind of like backstab your friends every now and then, now and then be selfish, um, be very greedy. Uh, you, you might start thinking, hmm, maybe, maybe this person's onto something. Even though everything we know rebels against that. The problem is these deepest questions about our very selves resist certainty. And if we're not careful, we're going to what? Forget who we are. This is Socrates' biggest admonishment. His first line of his trial is basically him saying in as many words, do not forget who you are. You know what you know. Don't let the seductive power of sophistry dissuade you from that. Um, a word, though, on this know thyself, and I'm taking this from Dr. Kreeft here. Socrates meant by know thyself to know what it is to be a human being. Know the differences between men and beasts, between men and gods, between good and evil. It doesn't mean psychoanalyze yourself endlessly. That's not what know thyself means. It doesn't mean take all sorts of personality tests and spend all night on the internet trying to figure out which Harry Potter character you are with some quiz. Uh, that's not the type of self-knowledge we're talking about here. We mean self-knowledge, uh, again, it's not navel-gazing. It's not endless self-psychoanalyzing. It's knowing about human nature. It's knowing about the things that pertain to human nature, right and wrong, good and evil. Um, that's what the commandment know thyself inscribed over the temple at Oracle, at, at uh, Delphi, is talking about. All right. They told you, this is Socrates speaking, to be on your guard, to not let yourselves be deceived by the force of my eloquence. They ought to have been ashamed saying this, because they were sure to be detected as soon as I opened my lips and displayed my deficiency. You shall hear from me the whole truth, not, however, delivered after their manner in an oration duly ornamented. Now this might sound like an oration duly ornamented, but it's not. Again, Socrates is speaking as clearly as he can. He doesn't throw in big, long, fancy words whenever he can just for the sake of it, just for the sake of making his words sound more seductive. Um, he's trying to get his point across as clearly as possible. And if only we saw the speeches that preceded his, I'm sure we'd see just how much more clear his is than his was, than the uh, sophistry that condemned him before. Because arbitrarily throwing in big, long, fancy words when a simple one will do, well, that's just one of the tactics of sophistry among many. But uh, the funny thing is that I, I do have students every now and then it's, who, who submit a paper at the end of the semester. And it's so obvious that they just had a thesaurus right there, right next to their computer, and looked up every word and replaced it with a big fancy one. Um, maybe there's some professors that impress us, but I, I would prefer clarity wherever possible over fanciness. Anyways, uh, Socrates here is saying he's going to be clear as he can be. And there's another point here that I want to quote Kreeft on. It's on rhetoric. He's, we talked enough about rhetoric in the Gorgias dialogue, 
But there's a new point here about how it's changed. Dr. Cray says, rhetoric has not disappeared today, nor is it weakened. It has just changed its forms. In the past, its form was mainly oratory, that is, speech-making, political or religious or legal. Today, its most powerful tools are not words, but images, in television and movies. In the image media, words are subordinate to images. When words are used, they are suggestive sound bites. They call up images. In modern communications, this is vastly preferred to argument. Can you recall the last logical argument you heard in an advertisement? Advertising has spread its technique everywhere. Products are sold by suggestion, not by reason. So we talked about the old school sophistry last class, but we gotta be aware of the signs of the times here and realize that the new sophistry sometimes sounds like that, but usually it's, it's changed its techniques. Usually we'll be exposed to sophistry, not in a big, long, fancy speech, because these days those who want to manipulate people realize that no one will stay awake for a big, long, fancy speech today anyway. So instead, they use the image media. You know, uh, they, 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 they seduce and carefully suggest things. When what? I mean, I, as I said, I haven't had a television in a very long time, but when was the last time you heard a logical, reasoned argument in an advertisement? I'm not saying it never happens, but not usually. I mean, usually, it's not usually a, an advertisement saying, okay, so here's, um, here's what our product's best for. Here's what it's not so good for. Uh, if you're in this situation, you, you, you wouldn't be best served by our product, but if you're in this one, it'd be really good. Here's, um, here's its stats, here, here, here's um, another uh, fact about it to help you determine whether you need it or not. Are, are advertisements like that? <laughs> of course not. It's, uh, oh, here's this, um, here's this Porsche car. If you're, here's this guy driving this Porsche down the French Riviera, and he's got women in bikinis dancing on the hood, and, it's, and if only you have this car, that is going to be you. That's, a, that's what advertisements are today. That is the new sophistry. It's not even an attempt at reason. It's this, it's this image-obsessed seduction. But it is an, it's so important that we recognize that the rhetoric has not disappeared. It has just changed its form. So the new sophistry, we see it in these images, sound bites, tweets, advertisements, propaganda. We have to be on our guard against it. We have to realize that none of us are immune to it. Some are more susceptible than others. Certainly, but I don't think anyone is fully immune from this. I still recall so fondly over 12 years ago when my roommate and I in college, we just took our television and just turned it around and made it face the corner. Never turned it back around again. Never had one since. Boy, was that a good decision. Anyway, even if you don't go that far, at least be on your guard and realize that none of us are immune to sophistry. If Socrates wasn't, and there's at least some honesty in him saying, I almost forgot who I was. Socrates wasn't immune, and certainly we are not either. Um, all right. He says next, please understand my inadequacy. I'm 70 years old. I've never been on trial here before, so you're going to have to deal with me. And you could say that that was a rhetorical device, but I think he's honest, because frankly he does kind of drone on in a couple spots here. But anyway, let's move on here. He says, that he's been mocked in the comedy of Aristophanes. Did anyone study Aristophanes in high school? The Greek tragedies and, and comedies? Sometimes that's still talked about in curriculum today. Um, well, Socrates was alive during the time of Aristophanes, the famous uh, playwright in ancient Greece. And how was Socrates treated by Aristophanes? Well, not too well. He was mocked roundly. So we can say fairly and accurately that Socrates was mocked by the mainstream media of his day, uh, which is a great way to get people to hate somebody. Just have them, that person be mocked often enough in the media. Next major point. Sorry, I still haven't gotten anything you need down in your notes. I will on the next page. Um, one more point from Kreef, though, before we dive into that. And we'll dive into that after, the, after we take a little break. But before the break, let's talk about this final point. Socrates says, a couple pages in, 
I met a man who has spent a world of money in the sophists, Callias, the son of Hipponicus. And knowing that he had sons, I asked him, Callias, if your two sons were born foals or calves, there would be no difficulty in finding someone to put over them. But you should hire a trainer of horses or a farmer who would improve them and perfect them in their own proper virtue and excellence. But as they are human beings, whom are you thinking of placing over them? Socrates is getting to this great irony. We know what it means to be a good horse, is what he's saying. We know what it means to be a good cow. We know what that involves. And we know who to call when we got a cow that we want to turn into a good cow. We call a cow trainer, someone, who's, someone who knows how to raise cows. Because it's fairly well, there's, there's a good deal of consensus on this. It's fairly clear and straightforward what being a good cow entails. And it's not that confusing how to bring that about. But what about a good human being? What if instead of having cows, you have sons? Socrates is saying, who do you call then? Who do you place over them to make sure they become excellent in their own proper virtue, as Socrates says? In other words, how do you develop them in those very things that human nature itself is directed towards? Because there's a lot more involved, it's a lot deeper and more important to determine what human nature is directed towards than what cow nature is directed towards. And let's see what Kreef says about that. Socrates believes that the most important questions are not factual, quote, factual questions, like what causes the tides, whose answers can be known and taught, but rather value questions, like what justice is and why we should pursue it. And even though Socrates strongly believes that the true answers to value questions, that is, moral questions, are just as objective as the true answers to, quote, factual questions, Socrates does not claim to know and teach the answers to these questions but only to help us ask them, to make the journey ourselves. We could almost say that according to Socrates, anything worth teaching cannot be taught, and anything teachable is hardly worth teaching. Philosophy, the pursuit of wisdom, cannot be taught. It can only be shown by an action. Philosophy cannot be taught like math, it must be caught like measles. Kind of an unfortunate comparison he uses there, but it's on to something. Here's the problem, Socrates. Here's what Socrates is implying in that quote there about the calves and Callias and who you call. There is no one to call. No one can teach you how to be a human being. You have to make that choice. You have to make that choice to act in accordance with human nature and pursue its own good. Because unlike math, it can't be taught. And I say this also, I agree with this from my own experience. Having taught and tutored hundreds upon hundreds of students in math at all sorts of different levels, um, I may have said this before, but just give me enough time with them, with any student, no matter how thick skulled, and I can force mathematical concepts into their head. Nothing special about me, there's nothing violent, don't worry. It's just a matter of finding the right technique. Nothing special about me, it's the subject matter. It is fundamentally communicable. Math is easy, that's why computers can do it. Give, give enough time to anybody, and a, and a teacher who actually can try enough different methods to teach a student the mathematical concepts and anybody will be able to get it as long as they have the full use of their reason they don't have a disability of some sort. Um, philosophy is not like that. Much about it can be taught but the philosophy itself is the love of wisdom and it can't simply be taken from one mind and clearly and predictably stuck into another like math can. So. Long story short, moral of the story, there's no one you can call to put over your sons and guarantee that they will become good men. They must make that choice themselves. But there is much about it, at least, that can be taught, which is why it's not a waste of time to philosophize and dialogue and so on and so forth. It's simply, the point is simply that at the end of the day, it's a choice each person must make in his own, whether to actually dive into the wisdom or just stand there on the precipice looking at it. Uh, as, as the saying goes, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Exactly. And that goes well with philosophy. But don't neglect to lead the horse to the water. This, this is not to diminish the importance of that. It's just to say, don't waste your time trying to stick the horse's head into the water to try to force it to drink because it's not going to work. It's got to be a choice that comes from the interior of the person to be just, to be good, to be wise. Even if 
you can and must and should show them what goodness and truth consists in. It's fundamentally an act of their free will to pursue it. All right, so on that point, that's a good point to take our break. We are now at the point in the trial where we have arrived at the moment. The uh, single thing that most people will remember if they remember nothing else from the trial, or perhaps even from Socrates' whole life, is the event at Delphi. And here is exactly where it's recounted in the original document itself. Well, Chirophon, as you know, was very impetuous in all his doings, and he went to Delphi and boldly asked the oracle to tell him whether, as I was saying, I must beg you not to interrupt. That's Socrates' own words there. He asked the oracle to tell him whether there was anyone wiser than I was. And the Pythian prophetess, that is, the priestess there, answered that there was no man wiser. Probably the simplest, shortest saying that has had such a substantial effect, not only on one man's life, but on history. I can't think of any other time where one single word had such an impact. Um, Socrates continues. When I heard the answer, I said to myself, what can the God mean? And what is the interpretation of this riddle? For I know that I have no wisdom, small or great. What can he mean when he says that I am the wisest? Yet he is a god and cannot lie. That would be against his nature. And I forgot, there's actually one more point I want to take a look at from Dr. Kreef's booklet here, and then I'll put it away. And it's on this line right here. At this point, Socrates has a crisis. Contradiction between his faith and his experience, his reason and his conscience. A lesser man would either simply abandon one or the other. But Socrates, knowing that the oracle often speaks in puzzles and riddles, hoped to save both his faith and his reason by exploring the riddle. It would cost him a total change of life and career, from stonecutter to philosopher. Philosophy, in fact, was born that day. So, a riddle. This is a riddle. But what is a riddle? Does anyone have a riddle to share? I don't know any, any I don't know any riddles myself. Any riddlers here? I'm trying to I'm always at a loss. I should come prepared with a riddle to this lecture, but I always forget to find one. What's black and white and red all over? newspaper or a book or something like that. So there's a goofy one, not very profound, but it's a riddle nevertheless. Why is it a riddle? Because at first glance, at first, uh, upon first hearing, it seems to be what? Just a flat out contradiction. It seems something can't be black and white, but red all over. And it seems to be just a contradiction, just nonsense. But it's, if it's a good riddle, you know, if it's a bad riddle, there is no resolution. But a riddle worthy of the name is something that is supposed to, at first glance, seem to be contradictory, seem to be uh, wrong. But again, if it is a good riddle, then you can assume that there is actually an explanation that dwells beneath the surface that reconciles the apparently contradictory superficial nature of it. And how do you know whether it's worth bothering to spend the time and effort to try and explore a riddle? Well, that's its own question, certainly. Um, why would you ever bother trying to figure out a riddle? Well, if someone you know and trust told, tells you the riddle, you figure they're not just messing with you, unless you'd like to hang out with people who are jerks for some reason. Um, you figure that this person is sharing a riddle with you because it is an actual riddle, not just a flat-out contradiction. Well, Socrates is hearing the words of this god that spoke through this oracle at Delphi, whatever exactly happened there, Socrates clearly has, it has faith in this divination here. So it certainly is a riddle because 
these years he has spent up to this point, I don't know how many years he had already been philosophizing at that point, he had been, become quite convinced of his own ignorance. He had been quite he become quite convinced that he was not wise. He wanted wisdom, he loved wisdom, but he was convinced he did not have it, so how on earth could he be said to be the wisest? That obviously is an apparent contradiction. Apparent, but perhaps not actual. Once Socrates applied his method of questioning, he realized the truth of half of the riddle. Those who seemed wise were not. Later, he would understand the other half, that he, who was not wise, but knew it, was, in fact, thereby wiser than they. Um, that's probably not the exact riddle that we'll be confronted with in our own lives, but we are all confronted with riddles at some point. And I don't mean the petty little things that we talk about in jest and conversation. I mean the real riddles, the real paradoxes, the real apparent contradictions that life sends at us. Opposing demands on our consciences, opposing demands on, our, on the mission that we want to dedicate our lives to, opposing demands on our beliefs, our principles. How we choose to approach the riddles in our lives largely determines the very value of them. Socrates approached it so nobly that he dedicated himself to investigating the riddle. And how did he do that? Well, we all know that he first naturally decided to go out and question those who were supposed to be wise. So first, and finally we're at the discussion sheet now, the Oracle of Delphi said none were wiser. The oracle actually just said no, but the question was already wiser. So what did he do? Well, let's just take it from his own lips here. I reflected that if only I could find a man wiser than myself, then I might go to the god with a refutation in my hand. I should say to him, here is a man who is wiser than I am, but you said that I was the wisest. Accordingly, I went to one who had the reputation of wisdom and observed him. His name I need not mention. He was a politician whom I selected for examination. And the result was as follows. When I began to talk with him, I could not help but thinking that he was not really wise. Although he was thought wise by many and wiser still by himself. And I went and tried to explain to him that he thought himself wise, but was really not wise. And the consequence was that he hated me. And his enmity was shared by several who were present and heard me. Well, who would have thought that if you tell a politician he's not wise and show him that he's not wise and he thinks he's wise, he'll hate you? Well, obviously that's what's going to happen. Hopefully Socrates wasn't too surprised, but no, that doesn't mean we don't sympathize with him, but still. Um, so he didn't find wisdom in the politicians. Those who are reputed to be the wise leaders of society he found no wisdom in them. He says, well, although I do not suppose that either of us knows anything really beautiful and good, I am better off than he is, for he knows nothing and thinks that he knows. I neither know nor think that I know. In this latter particular, then, I seem to have slightly the advantage of him." So he's not exactly uh, just, just lathering praise all over himself here. He's just saying, here's this complete fool, and I may be a tiny bit wiser than him just because I'm also a complete fool, but I at least recognize it. And that's fairly humble. So he's still in search of wisdom, and he goes on. Um, Who does he go to next? Anyone remember? After the politicians, he goes to the poets. That's a natural choice. But before going to the poets, he says, I found that the men most in repute were all but the most foolish, and that some inferior men were really wiser and better. By inferior, he means that facetiously, like inferior in the eyes of the world. And that's exactly what you'll find today. And I don't think it ever will change. That those who are reputed to be wise are often the most foolish out there. In fact, uh, the author of this book here, Dr. Kreeft, has a great quote. And he says, there's one qualification, there's one prerequisite necessary to be willing to believe all of the most idiotic, stupid ideas ever generated by the mind of man. That one prerequisite is, what do you think he says? A PhD. That's some irony. 
nothing against PhDs. I'm working on one myself. But uh, still, it seems that you get a lofty title and all of a sudden you find yourself entitled to absurdity. And that's what Socrates found in his own day, that the simple, the lowly, the, the more ordinary people were more likely to have wisdom than these supposed great wise minds in Athens. All right, so he goes to the poets. When I left the politicians, I went to the poets. There I said to myself, you will be detected. Now you will find out that you are more ignorant than they. So he's really ready to find people wiser than he is. Accordingly, I took some of the most elaborate passages in their own writings and asked them what was the meaning of them, thinking that they would teach me something. Will you believe me? I am almost ashamed to speak of this, but still I must say that there is hardly a person present who would not have talked better about their poetry than they themselves did. He's talking to an assembly of like hundreds and hundreds of people, and he says, any of you could have, in, could have talked about the poet's poetry better than the poets who wrote it did. So he's saying that they have, he's not denying, Socrates is a man of tradition if there ever was one. He loves the works, the great classics of ancient Greece. He has the highest regard for the wisdom in the ancient works of Greece and, and, and anything else he could get his hands on. But as much as he regards the wisdom in those works, he does not believe that the source of that wisdom was the authors of those works. And this harkens back to the general view in ancient Greece as to the source of art and the source of poetry. Not the human intellect, but what? I mean, what's that? Yeah, specifically these intermediaries called the muses. Has anyone heard of that? Like, have you heard, sometimes to this day you'll hear someone say allegorically, oh yeah, that person is my muse. What does that mean? Or has no one heard that? Yeah, that person inspires you. And um, well, the Greeks felt that way literally that all works of art were directly generated by these spirits called the muses, and that the artist himself was just jotting it down, like this stuff that he was receiving. And I have absolutely zero artistic talent, so I can't even ponder the truth or falsity of that. But I, I have had students who've had quite a bit of artistic talent, and, and um, they've shared, yeah, sometimes I feel like I'm not even the source of, uh, works of art, whether it's drawn art or music or, or writing not works of fiction or whatever else. I don't know. Any, anybody here felt anything like that? Anyway, I, I, many, many, many do say precisely that to this day, and I, I'll, I'll take their word for it. Um, anyway, although he, the point is here, although he finds wisdom in their works, he does not find wisdom in them. All right. He goes next to the artisans, the manual craftsmen. Now, if we're going to try and find an analogous category today, I think this would just refer to professionals in general, whether they're scientists or lawyers or engineers or anything else. Um, I think that's our safest bet for an analogous category of, of profession of uh, people here. And he says, what? He says, I observed that even the good artisans fell into the same error as the poets. Because they were good work, work, because they were good workmen, they thought that they knew all sorts of high matters. And this defect in them overshadowed their wisdom. And that, unfortunately, is the trap of the professional. You get really good at one thing, and you start arbitrarily deciding that you're good at all these other things, too, just because you're really good at one thing. Um, man, you see this a lot in physics. and I. I love physics, but you see some physicists thinking that because they know a few things about quarks, they can like tell you the meaning of life or something. And you know, you expect that from certain people, but the sad thing is that people go to them for answers. So like, if you need relationship advice, don't go to someone who knows the physics of quantum mechanics. So you're not going to get anything helpful out of that. Uh, they'll think they're giving you helpful information, maybe, but they won't. Uh, and that's basically what Socrates is saying with the artisans. They, ex they expand their realm of expertise and suppose that it covers everything that has nothing to do with, it act with its actual realm of application. All right, so at the end of this whole process, he says, O men of Athens, he discovers um, the truth is this. The truth is, O men of Athens, that God only is wise. And in this, the oracle means to say that the wisdom of men is little or nothing. He's not speaking of Socrates. He's only using my name as an illustration, as if he said, 
He, O oh man, is the wisest who, like Socrates, knows that his wisdom is in truth worth nothing. So I go on my way, obedient to the God, and make inquisition into the wisdom of anyone, whether citizen or stranger, who appears to be wise. And if he is not wise, then in vindication of the oracle I show him that he is not wise. And this occupation quite absorbs me. So that's what he does. That's what he's been doing for decades, going around showing people they're not wise. Um, what's really going on here? There's a little, because there is a little bit more to philosophy than just recognizing you're not wise. Um, intellectual humility was born with this mission of Socrates. And what does this mean? Well, I wager that you could take the world's greatest scholar, I don't know who that is, but whoever he or she is, you could take the world's great, the greatest scholar in the whole world and compare the knowledge in that person's head to the knowledge that is out there up for grabs, just up for the taking to learn. What do you guys think? How, how do you think those two quantities would compare? Not that they're quantities. This would be a lot bigger, wouldn't it? That's true. The smartest, most knowledgeable, wisest person in the world knows almost nothing compared to how much knowledge is out there. And if only we had the honesty to recognize that, I think we'd all take an approach more of the sort that Socrates is taking here. He's not afraid of certainty. He's not afraid of claiming to uh, know something when he does, in fact, know it. He's just not going beyond that. He's not claiming that he himself is the fount of wisdom. He's claiming that it's this thing discovered. It's not this thing possessed by any individual person. This might sound very groundbreaking or it might sound very old. If the latter, it's because, it's simply because of how much Socrates has inspired the whole approach throughout the past 2,500 years to knowledge and, many other, and virtue and many other things. If it sounds groundbreaking, it's because it's in such stark contradiction to a few fashionable philosophies, shall we say. Anyway, continuing on here, let's get let's round out this first question on the discussion sheet. The Oracle of Delphi said none were wiser, so he went about questioning those who were supposed to be wise. of finding wisdom in them and thereby refuting the oracle, so to speak. But he found that they were not wise, so he kept on asking. forward. That's his mission. He even says, this occupation quite absorbs me, and I have no time to give either to any public matter of interest or to any concern of my own, but I am in utter poverty by reason of my devotion to the God. Um, why does he bother bringing that up? Well, because it's relevant. He's being charged with all sorts of things here. And all of these charges inevitably would, re would involve an ulterior motive. Well, what's the primary ulterior motive out there? People superficially are pursuing one thing, but really, out of the whole situation, they really just want what? Money. It's perfectly right, and he points this out again later in the and I, I'll, I'll keep calling this a dialogue accidentally. It's, it's a monologue, this one, because there's not much back and forth. Um, he points out later in it that uh, the, the same fact, you know, maybe you wouldn't mind for your uh, financial advisor to be really rich, but you probably don't want, I don't know, if you have a pastor or something, you probably don't want him being super rich because that shows that he's, I don't know, not, not that I can judge anyone, but perhaps he does have motives, 
quite distinct from the ones that he has stated. And that could certainly be levied against Socrates, because Socrates had the rhetorical skill. He doesn't use it in the way the sophist did, but there's no denying that he's a master of persuasion and logical discourse and dialogue. If he charged for his services, like the sophist did, he would have blown away the richest sophist and how much he could have charged. Because it's quite obvious that he had way more skill than any sophist out there. He could have been probably one of the richest men in Athens if only he charged exorbitantly. I mean, he didn't charge anything, but um, he refused to because it's quite clear that he did not have ulterior motives. If someone could make a ton of money off something, but they refused to make any, that speaks volumes. And again, I don't want to judge any individual here, but it doesn't, but I will at least say it doesn't exactly speak volumes when someone who's already unbelievably filthy rich gives away what looks like tons of money and is still, what? Unbelievably filthy rich. Like, that doesn't impress me that much when someone with $10 billion gives away five. Um, with Socrates, we see the case of someone who could have been unbelievably filthy rich, but instead was unbelievably filthy poor. Um, and not, and he had a wife and kids, so it was really a sacrifice. Um, it speaks, again, volumes. All right, on to the charges. This confounded Socrates, they say, this villainous misleader of youth. And then if somebody asks them why, what evil does he practice or teach? They do not know and cannot tell. But in order that they may not appear to be at a loss, they repeat the ready-made charges used against all philosophers. There's quite a lesson in there. We better be very careful if we find ourselves using ready-made charges against anyone. What is a ready-made charge? It's just, yeah, it's, it's like scripted. It's like you didn't even have to really look at what the person said or did. It's just like a knee-jerk reaction when a certain type of tone even is brought up. And this happens all the time to this day. Uh, someone just gets a certain number of labels attached to them. Well, that's exactly what happened to Socrates. He points out, all right, who, uh, who exactly, where are the youth that I corrupted? Like, where are they? None were brought forward. You know, he's been doing this for decades. There should have been plenty of youth that were corrupted that came back to condemn him for corrupting them. But there were none. Uh, there should have been specifically evil doctrines that he taught that they could have brought up in the trial to point out just how damaging his words were to the common good and to, or to individuals. They couldn't come up with any. But one thing that Meletus came up with that was an attempt to levy a certain charge against him failed miserably, as we'll see in a moment. Corrupter of youth does not believe in the gods of the state. Those are, these are the main charges here. Um, in other words, the second one is simply impiety. But let's deal with the first one, that he corrupts the youth. It's a bit confusing to see what exactly his refutation of this charge is from the apology itself and from the video we watched. So I want to break it apart a little bit here because there's an important philosophical principle lying within it. But there is one little gem actually that I want to point out before we get to that. He says, what is their hatred but a proof that I'm speaking the truth? Socrates is being charged with a capital crime here. They're trying to kill him. That's quite an act of hatred if there ever was one. Why do they hate him so much? Well, if he was just some insane guy yelling nonsense in the street, what do you do with insane guys who just yell nonsense in the street? Ignore them. Maybe you laugh at them. You don't charge them with a capital crime, right? Because you know that they're, they're basically what? Crazy, harmless. Uh, some people might hate them maybe they're family members, but you don't find the powerful people in society wasting any time going on campaigns against these lunatics that shout nonsense on the street because they're, they're, uh, 
there's no motive there's no motive for the powerful to really oppose them because they are not a threat Socrates is pointing out rightfully so here that the mere degree to which he is hated says something it says in other words that he's on to something because what he is saying is a threat to those who are in power and it is a threat why because it's true their hatred is a proof that I speak the truth and that is the case time and time again anyone ever seen or read the Count of Monte Cristo great book great I haven't read the book but great movie 2003 maybe um, I won't spoil it for you but long story short this guy is sent to this horrendous prison off the coast of France for something he didn't do and um, he complains to the warden there upon being thrown in but I'm innocent I really am innocent and the warden says I know I know you are and he says oh so you're mocking me and the warden says no I really know that you're innocent if you were guilty of theft or murder or whatever you're being accused of here there's hundreds of prisons in France they could have put you in hundreds of normal prisons in France they could have put you in but you're here in this hell on earth island that no one can escape from and no one will ever hear from you again at you're here because you are innocent if you're just another guilty murderer there'd be no reason for you to be here so hatred is very indicative when certain people start to get so hated even though they clearly aren't hurting anyone they're clearly not it's very hard to specify whom exactly they're damaging uh, that's indicative of something that means they're probably on to something and I'm not saying it's a proof that they're speaking the truth there's plenty of people who are hated and, and are not speaking the truth but still we have to be very careful with that so he's going to address this this accusation that he corrupts the youth and it's a bit of a it's a bit of a lengthy one I'm not going to go through this back and forth with Miletus but he brings up horses as tends to happen in philosophy and he brings up horses because Miletus knows full well that if you want your horse improved you don't just grab some random guy off the street and say come improve my horse why well improving horses is a skill skills take what to, de to develop a skill requires what right. practice time effort those things are not natural they're not automatic you don't just wake up generating skills how awesome that would be you have to really dedicate the time to it consequently quite simply any skill Socrates uses the word craft any craft is going to be held by few or many any individual specific craft is going to be possessed by few by few people or by many people few because there are so many crafts and each person can only choose so many of them because of the multitude of crafts out there the multitude of skills out there if you choose any one skill out of, out of a hat those who have that skill are always going to be the few the few who dedicated themselves their lives their time their effort to developing that skill to improve anything is always a skill we are not born with uh, the ability to merely improve things by instinct we are the creatures without instinct um, we have some instincts but very relatively few so being that it is always the few who have any skill to improve what he's saying here is that in general the few improve the many corrupt and why is this relevant to what he's saying well you recall probably from the video as well that he gets may lead us to admit that everybody in Athens is really good for the youth really improves the youth everybody of course except Socrates now this might seem like an abstract philosophical point but really it, it uh, points out something a little more general a little more uh, important maybe and this has to do with societal problems in general basically 
by having the sorry state of the youth in Athens 2,400 years ago blamed on Socrates, they were doing what to him? So it was scapegoating, exactly. And why do we know that scapegoating is always wrong? Well, it's because of this philosophical principle. The few improve, the many corrupt. If you think you can take some general societal problem, the youth are corrupt, people are unhappy, people are miserable, people are suicidal, there's uh, whatever, Any, there's crime, um, the, the city is a miserable place. Any general societal problem like that is never going to be the fault of one. Sure, there are going to be some people who are more to blame than others, don't get me wrong. But general societal problems always arise from, this is not even that profound, but it's often forgotten, society in general. I should have said contra. The lesson here is contra or against scapegoating. Why? Because general societal problems arise from society in general. Again, obviously some people are going to be more to blame. In the extreme case, a tyrant would be incredibly to blame for a corrupt society. But technically, you could have a good populace even under a tyrant. It would be much harder. But we can never go blaming general societal decay, corruption, problems in a word, on individual people or groups. Whenever you choose some individual person or group and blame that person or group, for some broad societal problem, you're always scapegoating, and it's just a matter of time until what starts happening to that person or group. You're gonna be persecuted. But we are very slow to learn from history. Uh, and that certainly would happen to Socrates here. You're, all, you're always gonna deal excessively severely with a given individual or group if you go blaming all of society's problems on them, because that's just not how it works. Uh, if society has these general problems, it's because people in general are not being good. And there are no quick, easy fixes to general societal problems. The quickest, easiest, the, suppose, the quickest, easiest supposed fix to any big problem is to just kill someone. So just get rid of someone who is supposedly the cause of all these problems. Of course, they never are. And the problem doesn't go away once you kill this person. And, um, it's because we forget this lesson so often, that the few improve, the many corrupt, and that general societal problems arise from society in general. So we're always told to go save the world, choose some cause, and make it happen, and that's good. I don't want to discourage that at all. But it's not going to save the world, because saving the world requires everybody. And everybody must choose to be good if you want the world to be good. That's why Gandhi's quote was very good. Be the change you want to see in the world. At the, that's all you really have control over. Still try to change it. But recognize just how broad, broad problems come from. All right. Takes a while to get that uh, point across, so let me just kind of skip ahead here. The other thing he says about this that you don't need to have down, but it's, it's also an important point. He says, okay, Melitus, if I corrupt the youth, I do so either intentionally or unintentionally. Whenever you uh, divide an answer, a possible explanation into A or not A, you've always covered all possibilities. Intentionally and not intentionally are simply A, not A. So all possible contingencies have been covered in that dichotomy. All right, if you harm someone unintentionally, what should be done? If one is harming others unintentionally, what should be done? Correct that person. Yeah, tell them, uh, like, I'm standing here with my foot out, maybe, because it's just comfortable, and people are tripping over me. I don't intend to trip anybody. Well, you could say, um, that might not be the best place to stand. You don't call the police and charge me with breaking people's faces if, if I accidentally trip someone because it was unintentional. But Socrates is being brought to trial here. 
And there was never any attempt of his accusers to go to him and say, oh, by the way, you're corrupting people. You better stop. They never did that. So clearly they're violating the proper recourse if he's doing so, un if he's corrupting the youth unintentionally. But if he's corrupting them intentionally, which is the only other possibility, then we would expect to see what? They would leave. And yeah, that's not absolute. Obviously there are cases where uh, particularly manipulative people will harm those under them and those under them won't know to get away. Socrates can't go into all these psychological scenarios in this brief little trial here. But generally, if one person's intentionally harming others, others will at least look for an opportunity to get away from that person. Generally. Uh, Socrates wasn't exactly trying to keep people around himself. He just walked all over the place and people just wouldn't stop following him around. And he allowed that. Uh, but he certainly didn't never try to like keep this group of followers with him. Uh, he was no Jim Jones. Is that the guy who, is that the cult leader who got, made all the people kill themselves? Jim, yeah. He was just, uh, he was no, he was clearly no manipulative cult leader type figure. People wanted to follow him. And they did. And they became much better for the sake of doing so. He didn't corrupt anyone. Anyway, clearly the charges are bogus. The reason we're talking about them, though, isn't to vindicate some man who lived 2,400 years ago. The reason we're talking about them is because they're relevant to this day, because we do the same. There's, there have been many Socrateses, and the same thing had been done to them many times over. So this is not a history lesson above primarily. This is primarily a philosophy lesson. All right, now on to the next charge. Next charge, not believing in the gods of the city, but more generally, more generally, let's just have down impiety. He tries to get out of Miletus exactly what type of impiety he's being charged with. We don't need to bother refuting the impiety charge but we will talk about it a little bit more here. Socrates says, do you mean to say that I am an atheist simply in general and a teacher of atheism? Meaning just absolute rejection of gods or God, not just not believing in the right gods. Miletus says that you are, Socrates, a complete atheist. Socrates, that is an extraordinary statement, Miletus. Why do you say that? Do you mean that I do not believe in the Godhead of the, the divinity of the sun or the moon, which is the common creed of all men? Miletus, I assure you, judges, that he does not believe in them, for he says the sun is stone and the moon is earth. So Miletus is saying Socrates is an atheist because he doesn't believe the sun and the moon are gods. And what, of course, was the problem with that? First of all, it obviously doesn't make you an atheist, but uh, what... Did Miletus not know that he really should have? So it was Anaxagoras. Socrates didn't come up with that. Anaxagoras did. Um, it was Anaxagoras was the first big voice in ancient Greece to say the sun is not a god, the moon is not a god, they are matter, material. I suppose he wasn't right in saying the sun is a stone, but whatever, he was on to something. Now, why is that particularly relevant to bring up here for Socrates? Well, Anaxagoras, what was his first off again? Nuos, divine mind. Of all the people that lived in ancient Greece, Anaxagoras may have been the last you could possibly accuse of being an atheist. His whole philosophy was that all things are this divine mind that is behind everything, controlling everything. All things are directed towards it. Um, so clearly, by Socrates pointing out to Miletus, oh, that wasn't me, that was Anaxagoras, he completely destroyed the argument that Miletus was using to try and say that Socrates was an atheist. And it's interesting because there's an almost perfectly parallel situation today. Because I've heard it said sometimes, oh, you believe in the Big Bang? You must be an atheist. Does anyone know who came up with the Big Bang? Father George Lemaitre, a Jesuit Catholic priest in the 1800s. 
he create, here's a physicist also who created that theory. So clearly he was no atheist. Anyway, it's just an interesting parallel situation. The main argument he uses to refute this charge, though, is that he's saying, Miletus, I've spent my whole life philosophizing on questions that are essentially divine matters. The example he uses, again, unsurprisingly pertains to horses. He says, is there really anybody who could like, make bridles for horses and deal with horse matters his whole life but not actually believe in horses? Obviously not. That would be absurd. Well, Socrates similarly is saying, that's exactly what I've been doing my whole life. Socrates is not a theologian. He's not a religious mystic, although he has some mysticism. He's not a, um, he's not a religious founder. He's a philosopher. You can't say, oh, because Socrates isn't constantly talking about God, that he doesn't believe in God. That's, he's not a theologian. That's not his starting point. His starting point is simple reason. And yet, as he's saying to Miletus here, he strongly feels the source of all of these things that he philosophizes about is divine. So how could Miletus accuse one who has spent his whole life philosophizing about divine matters and not believing in the divine itself? doesn't make any sense. But don't worry about having anything down with that. Um, the, the much more interesting part of this question is the irony. And I want to read, a, I want to jump ahead a couple pages to read a quote. Because the first charge is ironic enough that the very one who is actually exhorting people to be good and just is the very one accused with corrupting the youth. You know, obviously the opposite is true. He is uncorrupting them. But even more ironic is this second charge of impiety. Impi I just realized I haven't defined the word. Impiety. Um, piety is the virtue of justice with respect to God or the gods. So by being charged with impiety, Socrates is being charged with injustice towards the gods. Justice is rendering what is due. So impiety becomes failing to render what is due to the gods. Above all, obedience, belief in obedience. So how is this ironic? Well, the irony is that he could have gotten out of this whole thing. He could have gotten out of this whole ordeal if only he promised to what? Keep his mouth shut and stop philosophizing. He could have easily, no doubt. I don't think the Athenian assembly really wanted to kill him. I think they wanted to scare him and make him stop philosophizing because he was annoying them so much. And they wanted a scapegoat too, certainly. But I don't think they really wanted to kill him, and I think he knew that. And I think he knew he could have pretty easily gotten off if he just promised to stop philosophizing if he promised, if he offered exile or something, um, so on and so forth. And yet he refused to do so. He says here, and I'm jumping ahead, someone will say, yes, Socrates, but can't you hold your tongue and then you may go into a foreign city and no one will interfere with you? Now I have great difficulty in making you understand my answer to this, for if I tell you that this would be a disobedience to a divine command, and therefore I cannot hold my tongue. You will not believe I'm serious. But the life without examination is not worth living. There's this most famous quote of all the dialogues. The unexamined life is not worth living. He, he joins that very quote that he is most known for throughout history. The unexamined life is not worth living. That is an, a, is an addendum to his point here that he cannot stop philosophizing because that would be disobedience to a divine command. All right, so does anyone see where I'm going with this? Why this is so ironic? Why is he going to be killed? He's charged with this, but why is he convicted of this? Because he has the very piety he's charged with not having, and for that reason alone. In other words, 
in his own words, and I lost the page now, but in his own words, he says, I can't stop philosophizing. It's not like there's this general rule, everybody has to go about being a philosopher, examining and asking questions to people in the marketplace. Yes, we're all philosophers in the sense that we all must ponder these questions, but we, Socrates is not pretending we all have to be philosophers in the sense that he is. And yet he must. Why? Because he believes, he is firmly convicted in his conscience that he has been commanded to do this by God. Okay. Because of this conviction, he will not, under any circumstances, stop. Why? Because the virtue of piety says you must always render obedience to the gods. So, the supreme irony here can be stated quite simply. It can be stated thus. Because of his piety, he would not commit the act of impiety that would have been required to escape conviction of impiety. Because Panda, if he actually were impious, impious, if he actually didn't have that virtue of piety, he would have readily just promised to stop philosophizing, because he wouldn't have cared that this God that he feels... He, if he was actually impious, which is technically how you pronounce lack of piety, impious, then he would have had no problem disobeying this divine command to philosophize, in which case he would have easily been able to get off of the charge that he is impious. So it is precisely because he is so pious that he cannot escape this charge of impiety. And he says that quite clearly. Before he's condemned, I can't remember if it's right before the vote, the first vote or the second vote. He says, I believe. I believe as none of my accusers does. He's not even saying, he's not, Socrates is not even just saying that he has piety and he has belief. He's saying he has more belief than anybody accusing him even has. And he's right, because he actually has the deeds to prove it. He actually has the real piety in action to prove that this belief exists, unlike his accusers who probably don't have belief. Ironic indeed. But anyway, there's a lot more to get through in this dialogue, so let's move on here. Monologue, sorry. I certainly have many enemies, he says, and this is what will be my destruction if I am destroyed. Of that I am certain. Not Miletus or Anatus, but the envy and the detraction of the world, which has been the death of many good men and will probably be the death of many more. There is no danger of my being the last of them. Someone will say, Are you not ashamed, Socrates, of a course of life which is likely to bring you to an untimely end? To him I may fairly answer, There you are mistaken. A man who is good for anything ought not calculate the chance of living or dying. He ought only consider whether in doing anything he is doing right or wrong, acting the part of a good man or a bad. And then he goes on to defer to the wisdom of the great poets in that very point. All right. So what Socrates is saying is, if you're at a fork in the road, and you certainly don't need this down, and... standing there at the fork of the road, and there's a couple options. One of them is risk death. And one of them is risk injustice. What is he saying? Is this, uh, his point is that this decision 
is always what? Yeah, it's an easy choice. It's not, it's not an easy one to execute, but it's an easy one to make. It's not a confusing decision is what he's saying. There's nothing confusing about this. It's very clear. So there's a certain motto that you hear all the time, and this would probably be Socrates' least favorite motto. What goes in that blank? There's a bunch of things that go in that blank that Socrates wouldn't be too happy about. But here's the one I hear the most that he really hate. Safety. Safety first. I hear it all the time. Socrates would say, no, absolutely not. How about safety last? Nothing wrong with safety. Please continue to wear your seatbelt. The point is, if you ever have to choose between committing injustice and taking a risk, always choose to take the risk. Even if that risk is the boldest of all risks, the risk of death, which is what he's going to uh, philosophically approach right now. <laughs> so you hear, you hear a lot of safety first. Oh my goodness, I've had a lot of run-ins with OSHA too. And, and look, it's like we should be prudent, we should be safe, definitely. It's just a matter of when these dilemmas arise, which, which do we... Uh, which do we pick? You know, there's so much terrible advice passed around when it's like what to do when there's shooters and stuff. And, and they always, I don't know, I'm no expert in this, but it just bothers me when all you ever hear about that is like, look out for yourself. Don't be a hero. Duck and cover. Well, what's wrong with being trying to be a hero? What, I mean, maybe you, you could save so many lives if you are willing to risk your own death. Um, and sure, maybe you're more likely to save your own if you just stay under a desk, and, and there's nothing wrong with saving your own life, but thank goodness there's people who are willing to risk death and uh, instead of always having uh, safety first. There was a recent school shooting, I think Colorado, now I forget the details, but there was a student who did uh, charge the shooter and prevented, no doubt, many deaths from happening. He died. The, the one who he charged the shooter and was killed, and I can't remember his name now. He was just a high school student. Uh, and uh, maybe he just read the apology, I don't know. But it's, it's certainly not an easy decision to execute. Again, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying I'm no Socrates, that's for sure. I have just as much uh, trouble doing the right thing in many of these cases as anyone, I'm sure. But at least let's set the principles down so that once the situations come to us, we can at least have our principles straight to try and approach these situations correctly. So what, why is he saying that one must always choose this, even with death itself? Well, here's what he says. The fear of death is indeed the pretense of wisdom, not real wisdom, being the appearance of knowing the unknown. Since no one knows whether death, which they in their fear apprehend to be the greatest evil, may not in fact be the greatest good. Is there not here the conceit of knowledge, which is a disgraceful sort of ignorance? All right, we, we saw in the very beginning of his wisdom, the motivation for, uh, of his mission, sorry, the, mo the, the, um, the whole essence of his wisdom from the beginning of his mission is contained in his refusal to ever suppose that he knows something that he does not know. That is the cornerstone of Socrates' wisdom. To choose to fear something, and I say choose very deliberately, there's different types of fear. If we're talking about simple biological fear, that's not a moral decision, so it's neither right nor wrong, it's indifferent. You know, if a tiger walked into this room, all of our heart rate would go way up, probably, and that would be fine. Like, you can't control that. That's, that's fear in the purely biological level, and that, again, is not a moral question one way or the other. But when you choose to fear something, when you will that fear, when you egg fear on with your decisions, when you rationally decide to fear something, what are you implicitly saying about that something? That is scary. That is scary, yeah, certainly. <laughs> And that it ought to be scared, right? I mean, that, it, that you ought to be scared of it. But if you ought to be scared of something, 
An even more basic presupposition about that situation is that you what? You know something about it. That you know something about it, and then that something is bad. So by choosing to fear death, you are committing the very act of folly that the very beginning of Socrates' mission was dedicated to avoiding, namely the folly of pretending that you know something that you don't know. If you have no idea what death consists in, and obviously we don't, at least not from first-hand experience, then choosing to fear it is choosing that folly of ignorance that Socrates is begging us to never succumb to. Very interesting point. Very interesting indeed. I do know, he says, that injustice and disobedience is evil and dishonorable. And I will never fear or avoid a possible good rather than a certain evil. He's saying, okay, this is definitely evil. Committing injustice is definitely evil. He just spent the whole gorgeous dialogue proving that. Just in our terms today, because it was two days ago, not just in his life, that was decades ago in his life, but in Gorgias, you know, he spent a lot of time proving that injustice is evil, and that we, can, that we know committing injustice is evil, that's obviously evil, and that we must avoid it. But since he knows nothing at all about this, he's basically saying, for all I know, it's a great good. So why on earth, I, how on earth could I logically justify choosing a certain evil over a possible good? He's saying that makes no rational sense. Why is that relevant to a situation? Well, again, promising to stop philosophizing would be an act of impiety because he is convicted in his conscience that he has been called, or not just called, but demanded. Uh, he's give, been given this divine mandate. So that would be an injustice, and death might be a great good for all he knows. So this is not a confusing decision. Maybe it's a difficult one to execute, but it's not a confusing one to settle in your mind, at least. And he again reiterates, I shouldn't say it again because this is before the thing that I read earlier because I've been jumping back and forth. If you say to me, Socrates, this time we will not mind Anatus, in other words, we'll not listen to the accusers, we'll let you off on one condition. You are not to inquire and speculate in this way anymore. And if you are caught doing this again, you shall die. If this was the condition on which you let me go, I should reply, men of Athens, I honor and love you, but I shall obey God rather than you. And while I have life and strength, I shall never cease from the practice of teaching philosophy. Teaching, practice, sorry, the practice and teaching of philosophy. Exhorting anyone whom I meet after my manner and convincing him. So here's more on that supreme irony. This isn't exactly a very, Socrates is not giving a very wise, uh, I should say, he's not giving a very practical training course here on how to get vindicated if you're ever brought to court. <laughs> He's, he's probably breaking every rule in the book as to how to, uh, as to how to like maximize your chances of, of not getting contempt. But again, he doesn't care. This is an opportunity for him to speak the truth. He's gonna, he's gonna use it. Maybe if he did a better job defending himself, he would have had a few more years. But then no one would bother reading this because it would be boring. All right. He even says stepping it up a notch. Whatever you do, know that I will never alter my ways, not even if I have to die many times. Can't get much more bold than that. All right, the next paragraph, I'm not going to read, but he uses, he brings up the metaphor for himself. And I haven't looked at the quizzes yet, so I don't know if anyone got this. It's the bonus. What image does he use for himself in this monologue? Gadfly. He's a fly. He uses the image. You know, if, you, if most people are asked to give an animal that is their image, like if you had to choose an animal that you're most like, what would it be? Most people would say like an eagle or a lion or something cool like that. Uh, Socrates says, I'm a fly. I'm, a I'm not just any fly. I'm a big, obnoxious, biting fly. A horse fly, to be specific. Um, not the most beautiful, glorious image of himself, but a fitting one. I mean, the midwife analogy was a little nicer, but this one's also accurate because Athens, he says, is like this big, lazy horse that is so lazy that 
a really obnoxious, stinging, biting fly is actually in the best interest of this horse because nothing else is going to get this horse to move except a real strong bite by this obnoxious fly. Socrates is that fly. Athens is that horse. He needs to sting and bite them out of their moral apathy, out of their moral decadence and laziness and self-centeredness. And um, indeed, that was the case. They had become decadent and morally corrupt. You know, many people learn in high school, rightfully so, their dark secret of slavery. But it was not just that. It was their hedonism, the, 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 the influence of the sophists. He really had to wake them up. And thankfully, we all have gadflies in our lives. And we don't always like hearing from them in the moment. But if we have the honesty to look back on our lives, years past, we we'll usually realize that the gadflies in our lives have done us the greatest good. So we should take that as a lesson for moving forward to treat and not uh, react too violently against them. There was a, the, the father of existentialism was a philosopher by the name of Kierkegaard in the 1800s. And uh, he loved Socrates, rightfully so. Who doesn't? And he said, there's a textbook that describes the scene. I love it. He says he was sitting in a, in a pub or something in Copenhagen, Denmark, smoking a cigar, as was his custom. And it, came, it dawned upon him one day doing that, that all of, the peer, all of his peers and the intellectual elite were getting praised for all of these things that they were doing to make life easier whether in technology or science or even in philosophy, creating all of these uh, compendiums to make it easier to learn what the philosopher said. Kierkegaard realized everybody is constantly being praised. In fact, the only people we seem to praise are those who make life easier. Maybe what's needed is someone to make life harder. He said, I'm going to be that person. Now, it doesn't mean you should go being a terrorist. Terrorists also make life harder, but not in the right way. He means he wants to be the gadfly. Nothing wrong with trying to make life easier. I uh, appreciate having a car just as much as anybody, for example. But when these conveniences become not just conveniences, but decadence, and worse still, when they cause us to tend towards moral corruption, that's precisely when we need someone like Socrates or Kierkegaard to come around and make life a little harder. He brings up again his poverty uh, that testifies to his, uh, his authenticity. And now we have a really important point here, the last one. And this is kind of tangential, but not too much. It's a very important thing to discuss, and I don't know when else to discuss it except right now in this apology discussion. You don't need this down, what I'm going to put on the board, but... There is a certain philosophy <laughs> called rationalism. Maybe it shouldn't even call it a philosophy. Maybe it's more of a category of philosophies. But perhaps the quintessential rationalist was a philosopher by the name of Hegel, George Hegel. And he said this, the real is the rational, and the rational is the real. At first glance, that might seem like a simple redundancy, but it's not. It's actually more. If I said a square is a rectangle and a rectangle is a square, which part of that sentence was correct? So the first or the second part? Sorry to throw more geometry at you. Close? First. <laughs> because that's why it's confusing to just go through in your head verbally like that. Um, every square is a rectangle. because. A rectangle is just a four-sided figure with right angles. Hope I'm not missing anything in that definition. But a rectangle is not necessarily a square. Why? 
Yeah, there's plenty of rectangles that have one pair of sides longer than the other. Here's a rectangle that's not a square. Not even close to a rectangle, anyway. Um, but by asserting both orientations of this statement, Hegel is saying, in other words, that the rational and the real are what? Not merely related, but identical. They're exactly the same thing. Which might sound, again, at first glance, OK, until you really ponder what he's saying here and realize how abhorrent it is. And this, this is rationalism. He's saying that there is absolutely nothing real that is not purely rational, that is not a mere product of rational processes. And what he really means by that, what he, what's, what's lurking behind his assertion, is a justification of his own philosophical system. Hegel generated, and I've quoted him before, I'm not saying he didn't have good ideas, he did have good ideas, but as with many who had good ideas, he largely overestimated his own intellectual prowess. And he generated the largest and most convoluted and complex philosophical system ever, probably. I look forward to never reading his works, or at least not all of his longer ones. Uh, he failed miserably, and I think that's pretty safe to say. He had good intentions, don't get me wrong. But his what he's saying here is my purely rational philosophical system encapsulates all reality. There is nothing that exists that is not perfectly contained within my little box here, my box of rationalism. Some people, before they even look into philosophy at all, erroneously suppose that philosophy is rationalism. But it is not. Philosophy, rationalism is one type of philosophy, a bad one if, if you ask me, and a bad one if you would ask Socrates. Socrates is not a rationalist. Socrates, probably more than anyone else in history, has been absolutely dedicated to following reason wherever it leads. No excuses, no holds barred, never contradicting reason, no matter what. That doesn't mean that reason is all there is. It doesn't mean that there's not even more beyond it. There's more to heaven and earth than is dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio. Where's that from? Shakespeare, Hamlet. Indeed, that is the case. Um, he's not, Socrates is not an irrationalist either, though. Nor, I think, should any of us be. So what's going on here? We shouldn't be rationalists. We shouldn't be irrationalists, then what on earth is the happy medium here where Socrates himself believed? Well, I'm trying to lay it out in this table here. And I bring it up now because of what Socrates says at this point in the dialogue. We're not going to be able to finish this today, but let's at least try to start picking, up, picking away at this table. He says, this sign I've had ever since I was a child, it is a voice which comes to me. And always forbids me to do something which I am going to do. It never commands me to do anything. It stands in the way of me being a politician. And a number of other times throughout this dialogue, he brings up this voice, or this sign, or the diamond. He brings up the oracle all the time. He brings up the god and the gods. He brings up his own emotions. He brings up all... Could you imagine Hegel bringing up any of that stuff? Absolutely not. For Hegel, all of those things would be unworthy of philosophy. They'd not, they wouldn't even be real as far as he's concerned. Um, later, more on this head and heart point, which I'll get to in a moment. And even a quote here. He says, the familiar oracle within me has constantly been in the habit of opposing me. He's not talking about the oracle of Delphi now. He's talking about the oracle within me. It has been in the habit of opposing me even about trifles, if I was going to make a slip or an error about anything. But in this trial, the oracle made no sign of opposition. I have often been stopped in the middle of a speech, but now, in nothing that I either said or did touching on this matter, has the oracle opposed me." What oracle is he talking about there? 
not the literal oracle, Delphi. He's talking about the oracle he has inside himself that speaks to him as a literal voice. Well, most of us don't hear it as a literal voice, but we all have it. It's called a conscience. The conscience doesn't necessarily tell us what we must do, but it does tell us with certainty when we're doing something wrong. And, we, and it is a voice that we all have. But guess what? That's not purely rational. You can't purely rationally encapsulate your, con your conscience within a nice little rationalistic philosophical box. Therefore, that too would be something unworthy of philosophy and not even real, according to the rationalist philosophy of Hegel and others. It is not what Socrates, the father of philosophy, says. He is not a rationalist. He is as rational as you can come. He's the most rational person you'll ever find in history, probably. But he is not a rationalist. This is proven time and time again in his works. And I think Socrates shows us the proper path to follow here regarding the logical, the extra logical, and the illogical. Um, let me try and first put something down here. And then we can maybe fill out the table with a few things. The illogical. must never be permitted. But that which is extra logical is not necessarily illogical. the life and the teachings of Socrates shows us. That reason must always be obeyed. We must never contradict it. We must never succumb to error, fallacy, falsehood. But it alone does not lead us to all things. Not all things are perfectly contained within reason, within the rational, as Hegel says. It is not true that the real is the rational and the rational is the real. That which is rational is a part of what is real. It is not the totality. There is much beyond mere logic. There is much beyond mere rationality. Um, so if we've got three columns here, illogical, logical, and extra logical, Well, it's pretty obvious what goes in the illogical column here. We've got contradiction, fallacy, lies, error. Goes without saying, hopefully, that we should never succumb to any of that. And then we've got the logical column here. That's also fairly straightforward. The logical is what concerns the head in general. As human beings, I mean this biologically, yes, but more importantly, I mean it allegorically. We have a head and we have a what? Conscience. You could roughly divide human faculties of the soul into two major compartments, one being the head the logical, and one being, yeah, the heart. Being a good philosopher does not mean neglecting heart. According to Hegel, it does, and according to rationalism, it does. Let me try that again. There. But they're wrong. Socrates shows us they're wrong. There's so much in the extra logical that leads us to what is good and true and real, even if we can't fully understand it logically. And that's OK. That's fine. We are not purely rational, logical beings. We have more than just our reason. Reason's supreme and important, but it's not all there is. So what else could we put in the extra logical? Well, we've got conscience. 
there's another power by which we reach um, reasonable conclusions, but it's not purely logical. Psychologists tell us that women have this ability better than men. I'll take their word for it. Intuition. Not purely logical, but it's still directed towards discovering the truth of the situation. There's intuition. There's having a sense of a calling. There's faith, certainly. All of these things fall into the extra logical category. Now, if any of these individual things winds up falling into this category, then yes, it must be rejected. If your heart tells you to do something that your head tells you is erroneous, don't do it. Why? Because the head, here's the important distinction here. We do have a heart and it's important and it does lead us to the, what is good and true, but the head is more certain. The heart is probably more quick, it's more broad, there's more things it can tell us. You can't logically figure out everything you have to do in life. But when you have logically figured something out, don't neglect, don't doubt it. Even if you think that your heart tells you otherwise. So there's the, these principles allow us to analyze cliche advice. What else do we have in logical? Syllogisms, talked about how those work a couple of weeks ago. We've got math and science. We've got rational discourse. We've got first principles, things like that. So the most cliche advice you could ever hear is what? That is quite a question. The most cliche piece of advice I've ever heard is follow your heart. Good or bad advice? Well, as with most cliches, the answer is it depends, I think. I hope when most people say that, what they mean is follow your heart in contradiction to your lower desires. If your heart, if, you know, we all know what we mean by heart. If your heart pulls you towards something, in contradiction to your desires for pleasure or comfort or money or popularity or safety. Those are all the lower desires. If your heart pulls you towards something, even if it's in contradiction to them, go for it. Excellent advice. Good advice to live by. If, on the other hand, by follow your heart, somebody means follow your heart in contradiction to your head, then that's terrible advice. Oh, I'm in love with this guy. He's, uh, he's unfaithful, he's abusive, he'd make a terrible father and husband, he's lazy, he's selfish, but I'm really in love with him. Should I marry him? Ever heard somebody say something, somebody say something like that? No, you should not, because that would be following your heart in contradiction to your head. That's not a confusing situation. You don't need to invite the heart into a question that the head has already settled with absolute certainty. When the head is, has something figured out, it's figured it out, it's done. But guess what? We've got to have the humility, the intellectual humility, as Socrates is saying, to realize that this can't answer most questions for us. Whatever it can answer, go for it, definitely. But recognize that it's not going to answer most things, so don't ever neglect this. This is going to lead you to more truth than this is. But don't neglect either. We have them both for a reason. But look, you can sit there Googling all day career paths and, and uh, making a big chart of pros and cons of each and, and uh, uh, just analyzing the situation ras rationally forever. And it's not going to do anything even close to just going with what you genuinely, sincerely feel inspired to do based upon people you know and trust and are inspired by uh, when you feel a draw and a call to something um, after being exposed to it, things like that. Those heart methods are just better for questions like that. 
you know, I know people who try to figure out everything with the head, and they still haven't figured out their lives. Like, people just can't figure out who to marry, and, and they just can't figure out what to do, where to, like, they're endlessly trying to figure things out that they never will, just using the head method. And uh, I'm not saying everybody has to get married, I'm saying people who know they want to and can't figure out anything because they're stuck in purely head-based methods. So we need both, and this, Socrates teaches us that. Um, there's more I want to give you, I think, for this discussion sheet, but you've, in fact, yeah, let me just give you the bottom row. You got one row there. Um, I'll do a little bit of erasing. All right, so this is not perfectly following. I'm going to put this above, even though on your sheet it's below. But the big question then, I suppose, is emotion. How does emotion play in here? Well, something that would be illogical with emotion would be allowing emotion to overturn reason. That would be illogical. And remember, the illogical column is the bad column. We never want to succumb to it. Uh, for Hegel and other rationalists, this, there is no extra logical column. Uh, if I were a rationalist writing this table down, I would have just had all this stuff in the illogical column. But that's not human. Uh, logical, then, is indifferent to emotion. The head does not need any emotion to help it reach reasonable conclusions. That would be the relation of the logical to emotion. The extra logical, how does that relate to emotion? Well, this allows emotion to extend beyond reason. Sometimes when you say, I don't know why I know, I just know. Well, that would be the extra logical. Just make sure it's not in contradiction to something logical. And I'm not saying I have this all figured out, but my goodness, this is an important question to at least try to address carefully. It kind of has a pretty big impact on how we live our lives. And there is what I propose is something Socratic. Something that I think Socrates would say, yeah, that's a decent way to deal with these three inspirations, these three categories. So there's still more to finish off in the Apology, but um, let's say finishing off the dialogue for next class. So the vote is about to happen, where we left off discussing the Apology. He points out at this, at this time that he has no regular disciples, in other words, students. He just goes about talking to people, and people follow him. Whoever wishes to follow him can follow him, rich or poor, young or old, anything in between. And indeed, he has quite a motley crew following him. Uh, but then he answers the question that some no doubt have, why on earth do people follow you? Well, he has a somewhat humble but also amusing answer here. He doesn't exalt himself. He says this, but I shall be asked, why do people delight in continually conversing with you? I've told you already, Athenians, the whole truth about this. They like to hear the cross-examination of the pretenders to wisdom. There is amusement in this. So Socrates is simply saying bluntly, it's quite amusing to watch me uh, show fools how foolish they are. <laughs> sure it was amusing. All right, more important point. He won't beg for his life. He has important reasons for not begging for his life. I, like, I try to keep my discussion sheets one-sided. I had to change that with Aristotle, but I would have put more questions on this one if I were okay with making it two-sided. I would have put this one as the next question if I did cover it on the sheet, which I didn't, so don't worry. It won't be on your final. But why won't Socrates beg for his life? He says other people beg. They're on trial and they beg for their life. They, they bring their wife and children out in front of the court and grovel on their knees and beg for 
clemency from the judges. He says he won't do that. First of all, he says it makes the city look ridiculous. He says these people act as if they would be immortal if only you wouldn't kill them, which is quite an interesting insight. When we cling so, and we still zealously fight for our life in a given time, if that would be unjust, it is as if we are acting as if we would be immortal if only we escaped death at one time, which of course is not the case. But anyway, that's not his reason for not begging. Does anyone remember why he wouldn't beg for his life? He's got an interesting reason for this. When you beg someone for something, you are implicitly requesting that they render a decision on account of what? Or on the motivation of what? Yeah, well, and that's, I'm glad you bring that up. We're gonna talk about that soon. That would be good. What else might we be able to put it, say it is? What's that? Guilty. Guilty, okay, yeah, it's kind of, if you're so willing to beg, that's almost, a testimony to your guilt, that's a good point. Even if you're innocent, if you're begging, you're asking the one rendering the decision to make a decision based on... Morals. What's that? Morals of the person's reason. Maybe, that would be good. That would be a good motivation for them to make the decision. But maybe you're hoping, if you beg hard enough, and if you squeeze out enough tears, maybe you're hoping that the person will feel what? Sympathy, pity, in other words, they'll, whatever it might be, you're hoping that they will render a decision based on emotion. And I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong, but Socrates is very uh, strong on this point, that to beg the judge would be to implicitly request that the judges render their decision on the basis of emotion. But the judges, he says, and I don't want to spend the time to try to find the quote right now. But in some, somewhere in here he says, the judges, he's addressing them first person, says, you judges are sworn to uphold the law based on reason alone, based on the purely impartial, objective application of the letter of the law. So how does emotion play into that? Not at all. So for Soc in Socrates' mind, and he has a good point, for him to beg would amount to him requesting that the judges do what? Break their oath, exactly. Violate their oath to apply the law in perfect objectivity and impartiality. So, recall that Socrates' conviction, overarching conviction, is that he will never, no matter what, commit an injustice. But, he, but begging is not in and of itself an injustice. He's simply asking someone else to commit an injustice. But asking someone else to commit an injustice is to what? <laughs> commit an injustice yourself. You can't just outsource the commission of injustice and suppose that you've thereby exempted yourself from guilt. We all know that. You know, if you hire a hitman to kill someone, you're guilty of just as severe a crime as if you did pull the trigger yourself. I mean, I'm no legal expert, but I believe that's the case. Yeah, so, and rightfully so, because that we, you can't just physically separate yourself from moral culpability and expect that to do anything if you're still uh, causally, you know, intentionally causing that thing to occur. And Socrates realizes that. Now again, this, this all hinges on the point that it would be wrong for a judge to use emotion at all, and I'm not so sure that's absolutely the case. But if we grant that, then we can, I think, see why Socrates is right on in refusing to beg. So I'm not going to test you on that, but it's an important point from this dialogue, monologue. Right before the vote, actually this came up last class, right before the vote, he does not have the uh, most strategic words for his, uh, those listening to him. He simply says that I believe more than any of you do. They're about to vote on whether he is guilty of impiety, and he simply says, I believe more than any of you people voting on me believes. They render the decision. You know, who, who remembers his immediate reaction after the vote is cast? Does he break down in tears? No. <laughs> yeah, he thought he'd lose by more. He was, probably, he was quite pleasantly surprised. If only we could all take misfortunes so pleasant, so uh, optimistically as Socrates did. Talk about, um, what's the phrase? 
talk about being able to see the silver lining. <laughs> uh, so he, he thinks, well, I must have done a pretty good job arguing my case because I thought I'd lose by even more. You know, at this point, he's, um, everybody's kind of waiting. Is he going to break down and uh, change what he change his tone now that the vote has been cast? And of course, he doesn't. He's able to propose an alternative punishment in order to get out of the death penalty. That was his right as a citizen. He could propose something else. And if it was a significant enough punishment, the jury would no doubt accept it and say, OK, fine, you can have this instead of death. But he didn't do it. Why? It's like you could almost say he was offered a plea deal. And this is so relevant today because this, there's such injustice in plea deals because, you know, they. I'm not saying this happens every time. I'm just saying it does happen. I mean, they catch someone. They probably are fairly confident this person didn't do the thing. But they've got enough supposed evidence. And they sit down, maybe a young man with a bunch of big scary men in a room, and say, we, we've got you for this crime. We can convict you for it. We know you did it. Just admit it, and we'll give you this instead. It's relatively minor. And then, tragically, they often confess something they didn't do precisely because of that fear. I'm not putting the blame on them, but still, Socrates is not going to succumb to that because by proposing a significant alternative punishment, you're implying what? Guilt. You are implying that the charges are what? True, valid, um, no, uh, that they are meritorious. But that would, have been, that would have been a lie. And Socrates would never lie because a lie is an injustice. And again, we're right back to the beginning of an injustice being the one thing he'll never do. Um, so he's not going to offer a significant alternative punishment. Instead, he offers three meals for life. He says, I'm not going to offer an alternative punishment. I've been serving this city my whole life and receiving nothing in return. How about now you pay me? How about you give me three meals for the rest of my life? So that didn't work out too well. They just, they had to then, the law was you then voted on the alternative punishment. And of course, he lost the even greater majority at that point because very few were willing to uh, be that generous. He would have um, offered some alternative punishment. Money. He offered money, but he didn't have really any. Um, so he would have had have some friends offered in his stead. And he didn't see that as validating the charges because money is basically garbage in Socrates' view. And by giving some, by handing over some of his money, he didn't see that as morally cooperating with the charges. Uh, but anyway, that didn't work because, of course, he had little or nothing. Five minia, I think, is the, sorry, if I can remember the actual amount, I'm not sure. But it was small, so it didn't work. I am convinced, he says, that I never wronged another, and I will assuredly not wrong myself. I will not say of myself that I deserve any evil or propose any penalty. If only everyone offered an unjust plea deal would say that. <clears throat> All right, so the final vote occurs. Now the death verdict itself has been rendered. And now is probably the point where everybody was waiting. OK, this is the real moment of fear. Death has been, has been sentenced over his head. Will he break down now? Not at all. He says, But I thought that I ought not to do anything common or mean in the hour of danger, nor do I now repent of the manner of my defense. I would rather die having spoken after my manner than speak in your manner and live. For neither in war nor yet in law ought any man to use every way of escaping death. Often in battle there is no doubt that if a man will throw away his arms and fall on his knees before his pursuers, he may escape death. And in other dangers, there are other ways of escaping death. And if a man is willing to say and do anything, he can thus escape death. The difficulty, my friends, is not in avoiding death, but in avoiding unrighteousness. For that runs faster than death. Everybody alive has avoided death a number of times by the fact that we're still alive. He says that's not particularly praiseworthy. That's not even noteworthy. The noteworthy thing, the really worthy thing to do is avoid unrighteousness. In other words, injustice. That's what he's going to focus on here. He says, you ought not be willing to completely sacrifice your honor in war for the sake of remaining alive. And he's using that as an example because everyone, at least in that time, took it for granted that you never flee from battle. 
Um, maybe they were a bit severe on that point, but it works well for for his, the context, the audience he's speaking to, because they all realize, yes, that would be uh, extremely ignoble to throw down your arms and run from battle or, or plea for mercy from your attackers. Um, and, and it also worked well as an analogy for him because he was in battle himself and never did that. He didn't flee in the hour of danger when he was a soldier either. Well, now he's a soldier in an even higher way. He's a soldier for truth, for principles, for justice and goodness, and he's certainly not going to flee from this. In the same manner, he didn't flee literally in battle. All right. At the end of the day, in our last page here, at the end of the trial, the last two pages, he wants to reassure maybe himself, but at least everybody who's listening to him, that everything's okay, that everything's going to be all right. He knows everything's going to be all right. He knows this is fine, this is the way it was meant to be. And he doesn't have any logical, rationalistic reason for knowing that everything's okay. Does anyone remember what he appeals to towards the very end as his reason for knowing that all is well? It's one of those extra logical things we talked about last class that he is completely fine with appealing to because he's not a rationalistic philosopher. The voice never opposed him. He says here, just this is the very end of it, Basically, the familiar oracle within me up to this point, his whole life, has always opposed me, even about trifles, if I was going to make an error about anything. And of course, we've discussed already about how that oracle within him is really his conscience, which we all have. And he says, my con in other words, my conscience said nothing wrong, it did not oppose me in anything in this trial. So I feel perfectly content now, knowing I did the right thing because the voice did not oppose me. He's not reverting to rationalistic methods. He's deferring to that which is beyond them, but still valid. Hegel would never have approved. Um, at no point in this whole, he says, in the past, this voice has even stopped me in the middle of a speech. That's, uh, that's a powerful conscience there. If only more of our politicians had that, being willing to listen to their conscience in the middle of a speech. They'd stop their speeches short more often, as Socrates apparently did at times. But it didn't oppose him at any point during this trial, so he knew he did the right thing. And then he talks about death again, whether it's eternal sleep or whether one goes to an eternal house. He has no fear. He says he hopes that it is the latter. He hopes that there is really something after, and he's looking forward to it because he can philosophize with the people there. He can philosophize with all the great minds that went before him on the other side, and he's very much looking forward to speaking, for example, to Hesiod and Homer. You know, the famous, we've got Homer there, the famous author of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Who wouldn't want to philosophize with him? So he is perfectly content. He ends his speech saying, Wherefore, O judges, be of good cheer about death, and know this of a truth that no evil can happen to a good man, either in life or after death. He and his are not neglected by the gods. Well, Socrates, as always, has a supremely ironic answer to the most basic questions that are asked. Why do what things happen? Why do bad things happen to good people? Everybody's asked that. Everybody who has supposed that there is meaning and order in the universe has been understandably perplexed by the conundrum of why do bad things happen to good people. Well, Socrates' answer is what? <laughs> they don't. No bad thing has ever happened to a good person. That seems to make no sense, but remember this whole point in Gorgias, the only really bad thing that could ever happen to you is that you commit an injustice. So this is just actually definitional, it's just axiomatic in his, the way he's putting it. Uh, since the only bad thing that can really happen to you is that you commit an injustice, if you are a good person, you are by definition one who does not commit injustices. So no, no bad thing has ever happened or will happen to a good person under Socrates' uh, definitions here. Now that might not be the most satisfying answer to that conundrum. We'll, we'll take a look at what might be a more satisfying answer to it at the end of the course, and we take a look at Middle Ages philosophy, at least briefly. But there's one way of looking at it. It's, again, it's, it leaves much to be desired, but it's, but it's interesting. In his final request, 
It's not the most common final request you hear before someone is put to death. Punish my sons. Punish my sons if they ever found preferring money to virtue. Because money is that thing that symbolizes all of the lower desires that we have that pull us away from virtue. So if my sons, and he had, he had uh, multiple sons, at least two, and they were very young. Socrates was 70, so good for Socrates. And I pulled that off. But um, anyway, he had very young sons, and his concern at the very end, his last request, was that they be maintained in the path of virtue and be punished if they ever start desiring money more than virtue. I don't know if that's ever been a last request since Socrates. Maybe it has been. Okay, and there goes the apology of Socrates. So let's move on to our Crito unit.